fuck harder when I was strung out on Adderall. You know, I still had another 10 years of meth and heroin addiction after that. So it looked pretty bad, man. But right here in these pews right here, you know, God can take from the, from the impossible and he can create a miracle. And I truly, truly believe that. And my work at the at La Jolla Recovery, we have 12 people that work at my work that all graduated from the Salvation Army. And they're awesome employees. They're awesome people. You know what I'm saying? There's so many miracles that have come out of these pews right here, guys. And just a year and a half ago, I was sitting in San Bernardino in one of these pews. And I was trying to trying to find myself, you know, I was trying to start over again. I was trying to find a play page. I was trying to create a new life for myself. Because when I got out of baseball at 31 years old, that's all I knew how to do was go to stadiums, play baseball, chase pleasures, VIP room, do drugs, drink alcohol, wake up hungover, try to do it again, year after year after year, until finally I was shooting heroin, shooting meth, committing crime in a jail cell. You know what I'm saying? Before we pray, so before we pray to the Lord right now, I want to share something, all right? Before Jesus came down and died on the cross, guys, we tried to we tried to live up to the laws of Moses, right? And the Ten Commandments, right? Not us as human beings could not live up to these because of our flesh, guys. We have a thorn in our side. We continue to have a dog fight every single day of good and evil, right? But we gotta feed the good dog. So that's why the earth, that's why the world needed a savior to come down and die for our sins. So that's what Jesus did. Jesus came down and walked on the planet and created miracles so we would follow him. And then we would end up, he would die on the cross. So now we can go to Jesus for our sins. And now he connects us to God. And we can have this amazing relationship with God. All right. This is not a religion. Religion ran the earth before Jesus. When Jesus came down, he created this ability for us to have a relationship. Like I said, my God talks to me like the best baseball coach I ever wanted, and it tells me, hey, Bonnie, let's go. Baby, you can do this. Hey, you probably don't want to do that. You probably don't want to do that. I listen to my inner conscience, and the reason why I have this amazing relationship is because Jesus died on the cross. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's thank the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord Jesus, so much for coming down on the cross and bridging that gap, Father, so we can finally have a relationship with you, that we can continue to walk with you, and we continue to walk in the light with the Spirit as we get our integrity back, as we learn a whole new way of life here at the Salvation Army, as we learn how to work hard again, Father, as we continue to do what, what real men do right here, Father, and we thank you for the Salvation Army, for every time, every door that might have closed in our lives. This one remained open so we can now have the gift of desperation. And like I said, all miracles start in the dark and then they are brought to light. So our miracle right here had to start in the dark. And now we're continuing to work in the light and we're continuing to love you, Lord. And we thank you and give you all the gratitude in the world because gratitude releases small amounts of dopamine so we can have joy every day. And we can continue to fly and we continue to soar like eagles. I love you, I love you, I love you, and we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, what's up, guys? So Right now I want to share a video, right? It's on NF, it's called Star Over, all right? Right here we're looking for a blank page in this, in, this, in this program right here. We're looking for a new fresh start, all right? And Jesus is the one that's gonna allow you guys to have that. Like I said, in my addiction, I mean, that, that last days of my addiction were absolutely horrible and after we show this video, I'm gonna do, a, I'm gonna talk about a parable because there's a lot of you guys in here, a parable that I heard uh, Kevin Carter, Kyle Carter at the Salvation Army, he said this parable and it changed my whole entire life and it made my life make sense and I was like, wow, that's exactly what happened in my life is what happened in that parable and let's continue. Remember guys, we're trying to find a blank page, we're trying to start over and we're trying to have a whole new life right here with Christ right here. Check this video, it's a good one.
so we can have a new, fresh way of life. You know what I'm saying? And I'm so thankful for that, guys, because I couldn't put the cut down of addiction until I was 37 years old, guys. It took me a long, 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 long time to reach the gift of desperation to be able to come in here and let the Lord seek into my heart. And like I said, I'm not 20, guys. I'm 41 years old, guys. I played professional baseball 10 years. I traveled the whole United States, guys. I played in Mexico. I played in Canada. I played all over the place. I chased pleasures for years and years and years and years. And the last three years, I've been super, super happy and excited and I have joy with my whole life. I want to share today about a, 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 a parable. It's called the prodigal son. This parable right here, changed my whole entire life when I heard it because I was like, oh my God, that's me. That's what I, I went through. That's what I did. And when they talk about when the Lord will, with the hundred sheep and the Lord will leave the 99 to go after the one sheep, when you become that one sheep, you will understand what that parable means. And this Bible will start to make sense, especially this life recovery Bible that relates the steps to recovery. This thing is absolutely an amazing thing, man. You guys got to give that Bible, that life recovery Bible a chance. But there's two brothers. This is called the prodigal son, right? There's two brothers, right? They work on a ranch, okay? The one brother decides that he wants to go and he wants to get his inheritance from his father. So his father goes, sure, son, you can have the inheritance. Don't even trip. The son goes and takes all the money and he squanders all the money, dude. He spends all the money on women, on alcohol, on earthly pleasures. He chases everything that does not matter on this planet, guys. Everything that doesn't matter. He ends up finally, famine hits the country, and now he's starving, and he has nothing to eat, and he's starving. And he starts to work at a pig farm, okay? He's at a pig farm, and when he's looking at the pig, and finally, the gift of desperation, this is what I'm talking about, the gift of desperation came into his head, and he thought to himself, he goes, he goes oh my gosh, this pig slop looks good to eat. He goes, my ser the servants at my father's ranch, the servants at my father's ranch, get treated better than I do. So he was able to finally step out of that obsession and he had lost everything, guys. It's really hard to turn your life over to God if you haven't lost every single thing that ever has been in your life, guys. I know I had lost every single thing to where I was 180 pounds. In that picture, I'm 180 pounds, strung out, lost soul. I literally like lost my soul to the earth, man. I dedicated my life to chasing pleasures and I was absolutely miserable because it's not what we see, it's who we become on this planet, what brings true joy and happiness. So the brother goes back home and he feels shame and he feels guilt to go back home to his father's branch. The same way we might feel to go back home to the Lord. We might feel some shame and feel some guilt. But when he goes back home, his father sees him from miles away and starts to cheer and starts to get happy. And the kid and the son and the brother's like, what is going on? Why is he so happy? And he ends up showing up and his dad goes, cut the biggest cab. Let's throw a party. My son has returned. The prodigal son has returned. The other brother that never left the ranch is now seeing this party happen and he's super jealous. And he's like, why, is, why are you throwing a party for my brother? He went and he squandered all your money. And the dad looked at him and he said, son, he goes, because you never left. You never went out to see what was out there. You've always been under my, my, my roof. You've always been here with me. But your brother went and he saw what was out there and he squandered everything he had and now he's come back home. And because of this, he will never leave home again. He will always be here with us. He will always be here. And when I think about that, I think about that's how when I came back to the Lord, how God received me. God received me. He loves me because now he knows that I went out there and tried every which way to find happiness and I failed, and I know that he is the way and the truth, guys. How that relates to my story, some of you guys have heard it, we got a lot of new guys, but I was at 19 years old, I was drafted by the Houston Astros, and I was given 120,000 at 19 years old with no foundation. I grew up in a family, my dad was a meth addict, my mom, I love her to death, she's a savior, she never did drugs, she was a single mom, absolutely amazing person, but they never taught me the foundation to be able to handle life outside of childhood. Like, I was literally a child until I was 37 years old, guys. That's just a fact. When you're playing professional baseball, you're waking up playing a kid's game every day, going to a stadium. It's like you're in a locker room with a bunch of high school dudes. It's crazy. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't grow up until I was 37 years old. But I never had the foundation to be able to handle $120,000. And so when I got out of the locker room, see, if I would have seek the Lord, then I would have been able to see the devil's fiery darts. Because the more we seek, the more we understand the devil's ways. 
And every single game I would ever play, almost every single day, around 7 o'clock game time would start, and then right about 8.30, I would start to already think about how I can't wait to go to the bar, and this night's going to be so sick, and I'm going to wake up with tons of girls, and everything's going to be so sick. And how many times did I wake up with a girl next to me? I don't know. Not, not as many as I thought. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It says he tempts you. He makes you think that it's going to be this amazing thing. And it ends up really, honestly, never happening. Because the Lord can't tempt. Only the devil can tempt. So now I know these things, right? I know these things. I had two years sober. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, like, man, I'm doing great. And all of a sudden, the stop came in my head. Hey, remember that time you got out of jail and did that fast shot? And you were with that one girl all night? And I thought to myself, man, like, my addiction trying to take me out was, like, the best time I ever had. And that's not what's really true. Because for days and days and years and years, it was me trying to find a band in my arm I couldn't hit. It was absolutely miserable. It was a miserable, miserable lifestyle. And then there was a point where like, I wasn't even getting high anymore. All I was doing was, was getting well. And any of you guys that do heroin, you guys know what that feels like. Or alcohol or any drug, man. All you're doing is trying to get well every day. You're not even getting high anymore. And then the last year of my addiction, I felt like the soul was floating over me going, all right, man, you're an absolute fool. You're an idiot. And I felt like my soul was, 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 was floating over me trying to get me to turn into the other direction, guys. But after I, when I was playing professional baseball at 28 years old, I tell you guys, I tried Adderall. So that's amphetamine salts. We got to watch out about prescription drugs. What drugs do in the beginning is they disguise themselves as heaven and alcohol. They disguise themselves as heaven and then they take you straight to hell. That's just what happens. They, they're so good in the beginning because scientifically, we're messing with the dopamine, you're messing with the reward system. You're supposed to feel good after a good hard day's work, after you do something good for someone. That's supposed to make you feel good after you have gratitude. That's supposed to make you feel good. But what you're doing with drugs is boom, blast in the brain, dopamine everywhere. So the minute that you put it in your body, the whole day that you were having feels absolutely amazing. But we gotta look at it as like a soda machine. You keep tapping into it, you keep tapping into it, it's gonna run dry, guys. And you are gonna reach an age like I reached at 37 years old, guys, and I wasn't that pro baseball player showing up to the stadium with Mansfield on his back with the crowd loving me. It wasn't, my, it wasn't that Monty Mansfield no more. It was a straight junkie with holes in his arm, with a missing front tooth, sweating grease in a jail cell floor down in Claremont. Finally able to break the obsession of the mind to be able to get clean and sober. Now when I talk about God starts his miracle in the dark and he brings you to the light and I talk about the sheep. At the very end of my addiction, guys, I was a week before I finally got sober. Me and my buddy Danny, we were going to go up north to be vendors in a parade, okay? We were going to go up north to be vendors in a parade. He asked me this. He said, Bonnie, he said, don't take any syringes, bro. I do not want you to embarrass me up there, right? So I said, okay, but in my head, I'm like, oh my God, dude, I do not want to go up there without the drug that I do every single day. For three years in Ontario, Rancho, Upland area, that's all I did was get fueled by this drug addiction. Everybody in the, in the neighborhood fueled this drug addiction. I could not quit. I could not quit. So what did God do? He came in and he plucked me out of there. And when we look back after you get some clean time, like I'm coming up on three years next month, when you get back, you look at the miracles that God has worked for you. And he plucked me out of that environment. He took me up north. And when I got up there, I said, these guys are all getting high. I'm going to get high. So I end up going to look for a syringe. Well, everywhere in Southern California, you can get a syringe somewhere. Well, up there in Reading, you cannot. So right in, turn me down. CVS turned me down, and then I finally went over to Walmart, and I got to the front, and she turned me down, and I literally, dude, this is the lowest of lows you can get. I bathed her for a syringe to get high, but God had took this away from me at that moment, and I literally, she told me, get the hell out of my store, you junkie, and this is talking about me walking out of that store, thinking about how I used to be a professional athlete, and now I've reached this bottom of the barrel, and I end up sitting on the side of the building, and I end up just start crying, dude crying my eyes out like a little baby because I couldn't handle what had happened in my life. Now, finally, when I look back, that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. I now reached the gift of desperation, and now I was able to come back. So God took me out of my environment, boom, had all this happen. I finally came to my senses like the prodigal son in the pig slop. I ended up coming back home after I had already squandered everything in my life, even sold my soul to the devil. I ended up coming back home, right? I ended up turning myself in to the, uh, to the uh, uh, San Bernardino PD, 
I turned myself in and I started my recovery at that moment because of that gift of desperation on the side of that building and I was able to come back home. And when I turned my life over to God at 37 years old, I said I tried every which way to find happiness. I'm not a young kid anymore, I'm a grown man. And I need you, Father, please take my hands as instruments and my, and my voice and let me decrease as you increase in my life. And this is the journey that he's taken me on. And now I'm able to stand right here and I'm able to spread the good news all because of the Lord. The Lord, all glory to God, has done a miraculous thing and he continues to work miracles. And everywhere I see everybody around me, I see miracles. Because of the Salvation Army, I see people overcoming addiction. In the program I work at, I don't see it too much. But this program right here, like I said, 12 people that does, uh, from our program work over there in our program. And they're like some of our best employees because they came here and they, they surrendered. And they ended up being able to have a new way of life with a blank page. They stayed connected. All right, the obsession of the mind that we suffer from in the, in the, uh, in the doctor's opinion, all right, it's going to continue to tell you you can go out there and use just one more. If you do fentanyl, that one more might kill you, okay? doesn't let you hit a rock bottom. It kills you like crazy. I just had a guy last week named Martin Freeman, San Bernardino ARC, three years sober, got off drug cart, now he's dead. Died last week, fentanyl overdose. It's killing people like crazy. It's an absolute silent killer, guys. We got to continue to understand, once we put the drug or alcohol in our body, and any of you guys know, if you look back at any of your relapses, you put the drug in your body, something happens on the inside, a phenomenon of craving, and you cannot stop. You cannot stop using until you, most of us here are in the back of a cop car, all right? So we've reached rock bottom right here. We now have the gift of desperation. Now the Lord can work a miracle in your guys' life. You guys all agree with that? Come on, man. You guys, do you guys all agree with that? Yeah. God is ready to work a miracle in you guys. All right? Hey, I'm going to share this right here, and then we'll get moving and grooving with the Lord. All right, guys? Check this out. Patient waiting. you got to learn delayed gratification. Okay? We're so addicted to instant gratification in this lifetime that it's absolutely insane. we got to start to learn delayed gratification. All right? Vices are short amounts of pleasure with big-time consequence. We're looking for long-term joy. Okay? We're looking for long-term joy. This is why I love this Bible. This is why I read this to you guys. Just listen to what this says. We all want to recover as quickly as possible. This is the Bible saying this, okay? We all want to recover as quickly as possible. It's hard to be patient as we wait for the process to work. Sure, we realize that we didn't get to the difficult spot we are in overnight. For me, guys, I dug a hole this big. I'm looking up at it. I'm three years sober. I'm still looking up. Baby, we're digging. I'm trying to dig myself out of that hole. Still, to this day, I continue to stay vigilant on my recovery. I got to get my meetings in. I got to share the good news. I got to make sure I'm putting God first. I got to make sure I got the chapel. And I have to make sure I'm moving, I'm moving and grooving with my hands. And that's why we work. That's why work therapy is what really, actually, truly works for the addict. The process to work. Sure, we realize that we didn't get to the difficult spot we are in overnight. We understand that we can not undo a lifetime of damage in just a few moments. But still, it is a challenge to wait patiently. Every part of the recovery process requires time and patience. This step also requires that we learn to wait to wait for God. The prophet Isaiah gave us this promise. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. The Lord, Jeremiah said, the Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. Waiting on the Lord has its rewards, has its rewards. We can remain calm when it appears that we aren't making any progress in recovery. As we learn to trust the Lord and wait on him, we will lift us up like beneath the wings of an eagle. God gives us the strength and stamina to bear up under strain so that we won't faint or collapse under it. As we develop patient faith, God, we will be able to endure the end of the race. And I love that, guys. All right, I love that. Hey, it's a storm on the outside, but there does not have to be a storm on the inside. I wait for the Lord constantly, and I continue to be feeling better than I've ever felt in my life. I now have a purpose that's directly lined up with God to spread the good news on how I got sober. And like I said, I played professional baseball 10 years, and I never felt the purpose like I feel right now, guys. I just want you to know, hey, I love you guys. I see a miracle. I see a miracle right here happening in these pews right here, guys. Hey, let's have a great day. Thank you so much for letting me come up here and share. Hey, let's go! Baby.